I was trained as a sociologist and interested in the challenges of studying neighborhoods and then in particular crime as an important part of neighborhoods. Um, what's interesting, uh, many things are interesting about crime, but one of which is there seems to be this sort of spatial precision to it in the sense that when police come on a scene and record a crime, and particularly here, I'm, I'm not talking about online crime, which is virtual and that's a whole nother topic, but things that happen in person, whether it's a robbery, a burglary, a motor vehicle theft, typically they happen at a particular uh, point in space, right? At a particular location and the police record the crime. It looks like there's a lot of spatial precision. Um, what I'm going to argue here though today is that the, there's a lot of, because of all the spatial mobility of people, um, there's actually um, a lot of unspatial uncertainty when it comes to crime. In particular, offenders don't, you know, I don't have to worry about my neighbor coming and burglarizing my house for the most part. Typically, offenders tend to go further and that becomes a challenge for how we think about crime and what we're trying to accomplish. So let me um, start a little bit talking about um, these ecological studies of crime, long history of them. The main question typically is why do some locations have more crime than others? At base, that's what they're asking. Um, really, it goes back um, to the Chicago School in the early 20th century. Sean McKay were studying Chicago and got interested in this idea that certain neighborhoods, and they were neighborhoods rather relatively large from what we think about now, why certain ones consistently had high levels of crime and others had lower levels of crime, and that was the initial um, focus um, that they, that was their question, of course, and there's been much research since then, but I would argue that a common feature of all this literature is typically there's not a very good conceptualization of spatial mobility by people. And what I mean by that is not necessarily where do you move, residential moves, but I'm saying during the day, right? Although you know, during the pandemic, maybe we were locked down and staying in one place, typically we move about more. And then that, how does one account for that when one wants to look at where and when crime happens? Um, a key theory um, for understanding where crime happens, and I always, when I teach my classes, I say it's kind of more of a framework than a theory, because it's sort of just a set of ingredients, if you will. And this comes from routine activity theory, which posited that there's these three key ingredients and that are needed for a crime to happen. One, you need a motivated offender. Um, of course, who are motivated offenders is, a, is undefined in theory, and that's where a lot of, one of the places a lot of complications come in. Um, you need a suitable target whoever that might be for different types of crime. And then you need the absence of capable guardians. And capable guardians is a very broad category of here, you know, one of which is police, but there's informal guardians. You know, you know, if you and I are both walking down the street and some robber wanted to rob you and suddenly I come along just as a potential witness, I might serve as a guardian and prevent the crime from happening. So it's a very broad definition. But that's, those are the three key ingredients. Um, there's this important part of it is that it's actually a multiplicative relationship. And that's not accounted for so well in a lot of literature, but I'm not going to go into that today either. But that's an important point that you need all three in a sense. You have an offender, but there's no suitable targets around. You won't see crime. You know, you see a target, but no offenders. You won't see crime. So it's this combination of these, both in space and in time which is of interest for those of us interested in where crime might occur. And then also this idea of the situation is important. So that's this idea, it's this coming together at a place and at a point in time, and that's what's important. Um, of course, the theory doesn't tell us so much about what these different ingredients might be, um, and therefore it's less informative than we might want. But it's a good starting point for understanding and thinking about um, how to think about where and when crime might happen. Um, if we talk about earlier research on this broad question, a lot of work back in like the 70s and 80s were using macro units. And largely this was a data limitation sort of thing. It was hard to get crime data at smaller units and it was much easier to get it for these larger units. And so that's what research focused on. Even 
um, if some of the theories operated at smaller scale, like in neighborhoods and that kind of thing. And that was, that's of course been since then a pretty big critique of this literature, but there was a data availability thing. So they compare different cities or different counties and why do you have some more, some crime, some have more crime than others. Um, now on these, we don't have to worry as much about spatial patterns of where offenders and targets and guardians move, because typically if you've got a big enough unit, people are not going to be so often crossing the boundaries, certainly at least for counties or large metropolitan areas. When you start getting down in the cities, um, it can be different. You know, if you live in a large metropolitan area, like where I'm at or where you're at out there, there can be many cities that are adjacent. And, you know, the city, I spend much of my time not in the city of Irvine, even though that's where my residence is. But although I'm in nearby cities, so they're still spatially constrained. Um, so is the city really the proper unit of analysis? And is that really the unit at which theories operate? But so that was a, a data availability. Thing. Um, in the ecological studies of crime, the neighborhood level data became popular late 80s, and then certainly in the 1990s and 2000s, um, very popular to use data was starting to come online, be available. I say that sort of with a, a bit of a caveat because back in the early 1800s, Ketele had data in Paris and did you know, kind of hand drawn map sort of thing of um, which areas had more crime than others, kind of a social physics as he described it. But nonetheless, the real heyday of this literature was in these more recent time periods, although it certainly kicks off as well with that Chicago school in the earlier part of the 20th century. Um, but again, the focus on why would some neighborhoods have more crime than others. As an aside, I'll mention that a lot of the theories that focus on these typically only focus on guardians. Remember, I talked about these, you know, targets, offenders, um, and guardians. And this literature typically focuses on guardians only, which is sort of odd to me when I was coming into it. It's like, well, where are offenders, where are targets? Not so much, um, interestingly enough. If we move in more recently with the availability of crime data at micro locations, um, there's been a big push um, focused on this, um, looking at either census blocks, um, street segments, these kinds of units, much smaller. And part of the reason is this knowledge, this observation, if you will, that um, crime seems to concentrate at much smaller units. So even if you look within a neighborhood, there will be you know, a, a concentration of crime on one block and a lack of concentration of crime on adjacent blocks. And this has sparked an interest in um, this um, micro list, this crime in place literature that is sometimes referred to. But they just keep going smaller and smaller units um, that they're interested in. You know, maybe next we'll be down the parcels and they're, you know, smaller units yet. Um, is how in one other point on this is now their interest typically because they're focused on these small units, they're focused on targets. And a lot of, and that works well if you've got targets that don't move around, like, you know, a bar or a bank sort of thing. And then they can say to what extent did, are those related to crime in a particular location. But again, guardians occasionally appear in this literature and offenders, surprisingly, not very much at all, um, at least explicitly when you talk about empirical work in the area. They're certainly very aware of offenders, but when you talk about the empirical work, not so much. Um, there's two big issues though. So as much as this is appealing, this spatial precision, at least what it appears, um, when we, one big issue is that there's measurement error, right? As police enter the location data and anyone who's dealt with um, police crime data in our lab, we spend a lot of time trying to clean it. You know, if the police officer has to write down where the crime happened, there can be misspellings, they can get the address wrong. Maybe they, you know, like us as a researcher, we want them to let us know precisely where it happened. And they just say, well, it's at the, like, we're close to that intersection, they'll write that. And because for them, they're not interested in, you know, the academic side of things of what we're interested in. So understandably, um, that spatial imprecision um, and it's very well known in the literature and how do you handle that? Um, you might say, well, an advantage is what if we were to give police a GPS unit, you know, a, a GPS. And so when they do the crime, they can push a button and it says, okay, this is exactly where the crime happened. 
that would work fine as long as they're right at the location when they write it up. If they're somewhere else writing up the report, that doesn't work. So all sorts of spatial um, imprecision, even though it appears very precise and sometimes researchers get very excited. Oh, I've got the exact address where the crime happened, especially if you wanna start getting down to the exact parcel where a crime happened. Arguably the spatial precision is just not there. But another big issue that I'm particularly interested in, and we'll talk about at more length today, is this idea that offenders, targets, and guardians can all move about. Now, for some targets, like I said, they don't. If it's a bank, and you're talking about a bank robbery, that won't move. But certainly offenders always move. Guardians potentially can move about. Um, and for some targets, if we're talking about a street robbery, the targets move as well. So that's a real complication that even though the crime happens at a particular place, this larger spate, these spatial patterns of when and where people are moving in locations matters. Now that's not unknown. It's um, in the literature, there is an awareness that this, there is this um, spatial component to crime. I would say there's two broad theories uh, with portrayal, one of which is crime pattern theory, which builds on routine activity theory that I talked about. Um, this literature focuses on this idea of offenders, targets, and guardians, and where they move. Um, I would say it's more of a focus on the psychological side of individuals. It's interested in precisely where, where individuals will go, what sort of paths will they take, exactly where they will occur. And there's been interesting work um, done on this saying, even if there's certain streets that are more likely to be traversed, going from you know, going to a destination, that that would increase the crime risk. And there's some evidence that they've seen that sort of thing. So a very um, interesting um, pattern, uh, interesting theory. Um, and then there's this second broad theory, I say, in that this idea that I propose is general theory of spatial crime patterns. Um, which rather than trying to focus on individuals and rather than trying to focus on specific locations, steps back and takes a much um, broader view of it. It's not trying to pre predict exact spatial locations, but more about spatial patterns. And like I, and to be honest about it, um, it's a much small, it's a newer and a much smaller perspective. And it's kind of me off on my own, if you will, but uh, that's okay. Um, that said, it's me, but it's not just me, I would say it's me standing on the shoulders of giants. And in this case, that particular giant is um, George Zipf. And the whole premise that I took towards thinking about where spatial crime happens is based on this idea of this principle of least effort and this idea of a distance decay. And I'll show you in a moment that I would argue and it's been shown empirically that this distance decay drives all of our spatial patterns. And as a consequence, it's important to incorporate that in for understanding where crime happens. Um, so who are offenders, targets, and guardians? Anyone taking this approach runs into the same problem of trying to define them. And that's a thorny mess. It also gets into some politically uncomfortable discussions. So I'll you know, set that aside for the moment. But um, Although one view is that offenders are just everybody. We're all equally likely, and, and that's one way you can approach it. But nonetheless, and there's also this complication that it's not like it's a discrete category where I can say, okay, this person's offender, this person's a target, or some other combination, because in fact, they're not discrete, and they don't even necessarily sum up to 100%. So this makes it really messy for trying to measure who are offenders, targets, or guardians, right? Some gang members might be more likely to be offenders, but they're also more likely to be targets. And in some instances, you know, there, is, you know, there's um, evidence that they're taking care of their neighborhood and therefore acting as guardians. So they're very involved. So that's a real complication that I'm gonna set aside for the moment. But if certainly if you're wanting to think about the spatial pattern, that's a, a challenging starting point for thinking about it. But if we could define who those people were, and even as a starting point, when you know, I just say, well, everybody, everyone's equally likely to be in each of those categories, we could still use that as a starting point of, um, if, and if we did, then the first question would be, where do they live? And again, you just use the census population, then know where people live. Um, and then where do they travel would be the other thing. 
um, what types of locations are people likely to go to in their normal daily routines. Um, and if we could build that, we could end up with this idea of a crime, what I refer to as a crime potentiality, in that a certain location at certain times of day, depending on the number of people and the possible confluence of offenders and targets. And so this, I talked about this at length in this paper of mine from Criminology in 2016, where I introduced this um, idea. Um, but if we talk about these spatial patterns of where do folks go, um, what we see over and over and over again is this you know, decay, spatial decay, if you will. And, and the exact function can be debated and, and, and estimated, if you will. Um, for simplicity here, I'm gonna be just talking about exponential decays as an approximation. They seem to work pretty well for these different um, patterns that we observe. Um, again, that beta function for defining the decay can be different um, and will be different for certain types of things. But what we nonetheless see is that for offenders, where do offenders go? Well, offenders prefer to offend nearer by rather than further away. And this has been shown empirically over and over again. Um, there's some discussion, maybe you won't offend right near your area. There's, so there would be a blip, a downward blip for the, you know, your local street or something, and then it goes up and then you see this decay again. Um, but nonetheless, this seems to be the general pattern that's been found over and over and over again. We talk about where targets go. There's all sorts of literature. Where do people go to shop and stuff like that? I might have a particular type of, you know, maybe I want to say I want, I want to go to a Whole Foods. Um, so I'm not going to go to this place just right nearby. I'm going to go a little further. But it's nonetheless the case I'm going to the Whole Foods near me. I'm not going to the one 30 miles away. And you see this over and over again that this decay um, guides how people work. And in fact, it's such a strong pattern, my argument is that we can actually use this information for making these kinds of general predictions, not about a crime that'll happen to a certain person at a certain time, but these general patterns that go on. And likewise with the guardians, um, you know, what is a guardian is another long debate. Um, and what we're talking, whether it's somebody keeping an eye in their particular neighborhood, which is where a lot of the literature has focused most of the time. That might be, you know, certainly my house, maybe my street, maybe a few more streets, or maybe it's a little broader. We don't know. There's not good evidence on that. Um, and so there's uncertainty about what that might be, um, but that would be an active area um, to look at. So in this paper, I, I did what I would just say is a proof of concept for this general theory of these spatial crime patterns. And again, the key is it's spatial and temporal. And so what this strategy was, it says, okay, if crime indeed requires this confluence of offenders targets and, and, and a lack of guardians, I should say, in space and time, then first we try to predict the locations of where these, these different types of people might live, and then try to predict where they might go at various times of day. And again, using specific, we know where certain um, retail locations are and parks and other types of locations that might be attractive. We know in general the certain hours of the day those types of places um, operate. And if we use this spatial decay and just say, okay, people are more likely to go to a nearer place than another, and a further place, then we will see this pattern. And that's what I did in the approach. And that, again, that generates this crime potentiality. And again, distributing it over the hours of the day and try to make predictions on when and where you'll see crime happen. And certainly on this small scale example, it seemed to have some doing that. This was, again, the study was in Santa Ana. This was a plot for all times of the day, and I'll just show you a couple of quickly um, for specific hours, which is what typically we're more interested in. That's the argument is that crime happens at a place in a point in time. Um, but on these, this, the x-axis was trying to say, you know, where will there be more targets in a particular location? And then these interactions, because again, it's a multiplicative thing, um, was trying to look at um, the presence of offenders and right and so this is you know no offenders at all you know low uh, high and and very high oops I've got it reversed don't I um, no offenders is up here and so we see these changes no it's not I'm I'm colorblind here I was right and I had a quick question in the sure. chat box I think is a pertinent one for now and it was on um, the potentiality of location at a time of day or the day slash hour of the day. So can it go to weeks 
uh, per month or month or per year? Is there some kind of um, constraint there or regular disaggregation that you've found is useful? No, that's a, I mean, that would be an active area of research here. I mean, the very first cut I was just trying to do, um, I was at eight, most commonly we'll split between weekdays and weekends because that's when you'll see the most differences um, in the spatial patterns of people for a lot of people. So you, we can split it that way. Um, in principle, certainly you could move on to um, seasonality and other features like that. I certainly was not doing that as a very first cut of it, but it's certainly feasible to do that. Thanks. Okay. Mary, yeah. I don't know if that just gave uh, good justice to the question, but feel free to follow up if there's anything else. Okay. Um, so that was overall, this is, um, Oh, got it. Okay. This was, um, for instance, between 1 and 2 a.m. And again, the same thing. And so showing this strong interaction effect, which is exactly what we expected to see, but certainly this potentiality seemed to work well in that way. You know, if you have many um, offenders, uh, as you have more targets, you get more crime. And of course, the presence of offenders seemed to be the most important thing when there was few targets between 1 and 2 a.m. These are all approximations, and these aren't counts of the exact number of it, but, um, but you get the general idea of what it was trying to do, trying to say, okay, this can work in principle. Um, this would be an argument. And of course, there's this challenge with measuring offenders, targets, and guardians. Arguably, if you get enough guardians in a place, enough people around, then you would start to see, potentially you would see crime starting to go down. You would think if there's so many people, why would you, why would I rob someone in the middle of a busy street, for instance? But setting that aside for the moment. Um, and then last one, this was um, a, in a late morning, 10 to 11 a.m. What do we see? And again, it was the same pattern um, for, again, for robberies that, you know, a high number of offenders, um, there was more crime. Here, you do see this negative effect between, you know, more targets, which might be guardians in, in that sense that there was actually less crime. So it was the first cut, it was, and it seemed to work. Um, to some, as we might expect. And again, that was, for me, that was the strategy was to start with this idea of this decay function. And that's gonna be the continued theme of the rest of the talk today and say, okay, um, that people behave, we should be utilizing this information in trying to explore crime. Um, going back to the earlier point about, you know, units of analysis, cities, neighborhoods, small blocks, Ralph Taylor had a book recently in a very nice book and talks about all these different issues of temporal and spatial scale. And he said, what is the proper unit of analysis? And he struggles through it. And my answer is there's none, right? And that's, you know, you might say if you want to, if you're interested only in bank robberies, maybe you're interested in that. But um, typically when we're trying to understand crime, because of the way people move around, there isn't um, specific geographic units that you need to account for both about where people live, where they go, and where opportunities are located for crime. Um, just as a side note, I had done a paper some time back with another student of mine, Adam Besson, where this was more rooted in the, um, the meso, the neighborhood level research, if you will. And there, the critique I thought is it doesn't make sense to use census tracts or block groups or something like that. These non-overlapping units because they don't define how people live their lives. So we used egohood, which is a block at the center and a buffer around it. And so you end up with this overlapping, which is tons of spatial autocorrelation, of course, but that's just a statistical problem to deal with. But we said this is a more realistic way of accounting for neighborhood effects because this is more reasonable for characterizing people's lives. And it seemed to do quite well. Um, but you might also think if I was going to have to have any unit, I would say that it loses the spatial precision of a particular location, but at least on average, it's going to capture where people move. But um, that's if I was forced to pick one unit. And I would say, no, it's not. It's, again, because of these um, spatial patterns, we need to account for that. Um, another question I explored in a recent um, paper as a simulation study, I was, got interested in this idea of what do we learn in these standard ecological studies of crime where people get data, say in census tracts, for example, and they get crime aggregated the tracts and they get their, their independent variables 
and they do the regression model and they get the results. And what do they learn from that? If indeed these spatial patterns are what drive things, drive things. And so in this paper, what I did is I said, okay, let's simulate data from this idea that people live in locations, um, there's opportunities at certain places and they're more likely to go near places. What does that look like? And then what, how can we model that? How would we model that? So it was a simulation project. Um, the targets, I made it simpler. They were specific locations. So I didn't have targets moving about just to, and I didn't have guardians in there. So I was trying to just have set targets, offenders moving about, um, again, as a starting point. Um, I used two different types of measures of offenders. One of which was this disproportionate likelihood that certain people are more likely to be offenders than others. Again, that gets politically uncomfortable, but this is a simulation. So I can just say certain people are more likely to be offenders, some less likely, and I use that approach. And the second was that everybody was offenders. And so I use a particular area, I use actually Orange County where I live, as just as an easy way rather than simulating from scratch. And I just use the census data where people live um, for simulating the data and the crime, et cetera. Um, this was an interesting part of it. There was two assumptions of be offender behavior in target rich environments. And this has gotten no, um, no discussion and no work on this at all. But how, if I'm in an area and there's lots of opportunities nearby, will I have unlimited offending? I'll just offend more. Or is there a sort of satiation thing where that's zero sum? If there's more opportunities nearby, then I'll just perhaps travel shorter distances, but still offend the same amount if I, there's less opportunities nearby. No discussion of that in the literature, but actually had important consequences um, in this simulation. One interesting thing I will mention from this, and this is the motivation for this project I'm talking about here, is when we, um, if you've got, you start with where offenders are and they offend in this distance decay pattern, if you, go to the other end and say, okay, where are the targets located? And now if you do a distance to Cape from the target out to where offenders live, um, maybe it's in obvious, maybe it's intuitive, then in fact, that's gonna be able to capture the same thing. It doesn't so much if there's this satiation thing, interestingly enough, but there's unlimited offending, this will work just fine. And what I found in this study is you could do a, you know, a simple regression model where you have the number of targets, you do the number of offenders as a distance decay, and you do the interaction of them, and that would work, it explains it perfectly, essentially, right? And of course, that's not grand, that was, that's how the model is built, but it shows, in a sense, that you could, if you start with the location and talk about offenders with the distance decay from there, um, that's one way you can think about um, measuring where crime might happen. And going back earlier, I talked about these neighborhood level studies, you know, some have looked at where do offenders live and then they use neighborhood characteristics to predict that. Some have said, where does crime happen? They use neighborhood characteristics to predict that. Um, sort of the same thing. But in fact, if people live one place and, and offend somewhere else, that's not accounted for so much in those approaches, not even thought about so much. But at least in this case, what I found was that, yeah, if you do this, like even I did an, as an part of this simulation, I said, okay, what if you did have sense? You, you were gonna aggregate the tracks. You could just do it the way we typically do. We do counts of these offenders and targets in a place and sum it up, how, you know, how well does that do? Or what if you actually said, here's the number of offenders, but I'm gonna look at them as a spatial decay from this location, even though I'm aggregating that to the track, that would do a better job of predicting how much crime happened in a location. So again, an argument for, thinking about not only where offenders are, but this distance decay that in fact, even if you're doing this kind of old school sort of approach of aggregating the census tracts, it's still, um, there are improved models in that way. Um, again, if it's satiation, then the, it, it becomes more complicated. It doesn't do as well, but it still does better, but not as well. And that's um, interesting because there's just not much literature of thought on offender behavior in that. Okay, um, I think I'm doing okay on time. I see here so. So for this project, we're taking this is our setup, and we wanted to consider, you know, trying to spatially explicitly measure some of these constructs we're interested in. So we didn't, you know, if we're we're going to start with small geographic units, street segments, 
as for where the crime happens, but then we wanted to measure various features um, around that environment. And, and what might matter, and we decided that there's at least three key types of spatial patterns that one might um, conceive of in studies. And indeed, these are these exist in one way or another in the literature. Um, maybe they're described explicitly, maybe not, but we'd said this is what they might be. And the first, the most obvious one is decay functions, right? And that's what I've been talking about, offenders targets or whatever, if I knew where offenders live and it's, there's, there's a decay and where they go, then I would want to measure that. If I somehow magically knew where were the offenders in my area, I would somehow incorporate them with a decay function. That seems natural. Second, we said that there's a lot of literature that mixing in environments seems important in different ways. This can create conflict. Um, it can reduce the ability for people to work together in neighborhoods. Um, the most obvious ones used are inequality. And we see this even gentrifying neighborhoods, which increases inequality, but that can create stress and um, conflict and which can increase crime. But also um, racial ethnic change in neighborhoods that can also bring this about. And so there was, so there's, um, literature arguing that that's the case as well. And then the third, we said this is a little newer and hasn't been as much done, but this idea of relational patterns as what's um, a, specific, a specific comparison between your location, whether it's your local micro location or your meso, your neighborhood level, and what's nearby, and that that might matter. Let me describe each of these a little more in depth. First of all, the idea of decay functions. And again, based on these idea of targets and offenders and guardians and where they might go. And so for simplicity, we, we wanted to use an exponential function on these. The nice feature about that is then you've got this beta um, value that guides the steepness of the decay. And again, our thinking was that you would see this different, perhaps a different steepness of the decay for different types of features. And that becomes something we want to explore uh, in this project. Now, first, if we talk about targets such as businesses, um, this would arguably probably be a very sharp decay. And it's not just, you know, crimes don't necessarily happen just inside the business, which would be no decay at all, obviously. But you might be something where you go to a club and then you have to walk three blocks to get back to your car and you're at risk, um, perhaps, of uh, being robbed, say, as you're walking those three blocks or if it's a bar getting in a fight afterwards. And, and indeed, this has been observed that there's this really sharp distance decay that on that block and two blocks and maybe three blocks away, you can see crime. So that was our thinking is like, you know, probably would look um, something like that. Um, if we're talking about targets and where targets go, we go a much broader um, area and therefore it's a much broader decay. Um, offenders, same thing. If we could define who offenders are, they have a broader decay, relatively speaking. Guardians, if they're homeowners, um, again, potentially a sharper decay, right? You're, you care about your home, your street, but maybe a few blocks. It depends how uh, broad that area would be, but that would be a sharper decay, maybe not as sharp as those targets, but um, certainly sharper than where uh, offenders might travel. And this is nothing new for those in, you know, familiar with spatial decays, but this just to remind ourselves, if you will, of what these decays look like. And this is an exponential decay. So again, the largest, you know, a, a beta of negative five is the sharpest. Case quite sharply. Um, negative four is a little less, negative three a little less. This at the other extreme, this is a negative 0.25 decay, and you can see it's it's much less sharp. And so that's going to be our idea. We wanted to create these measures, but then we're going to use these different um, decay functions um, to characterize um, the patterns of them. I also want to mention, I can't remember if I got in the slide, but often the strategy, and I've done this myself, is like we'll measure say bars in, you know, on the segment itself, and then we'll do a spatial decay measure, um, right, of how many bars are nearby. The problem that we run into there is oftentimes is there can be a high 
uh, correlation between the segment and the nearby area for many of these different types of measures we have. And so therefore, then it becomes a challenge. What do you do? And our thinking here is that, well, we think the decay itself is more proper to directly measure. And the nice thing about the exponential decay is that you know, the, the original unit itself has a value of one, right? And so it's the same way. So we like it for that reason. The second category of mixing, like I said, um, there's racial ethnic heterogeneity, income inequality. Um, the problem with research using these non-overlapping units is A, they're not real neighborhood units, right? I don't even know where the, my census tract boundaries are. It doesn't determine my social life at all. Um, and the other thing is they're typically defined to minimize these mixing values. So, right, neighborhoods are often defined on similarity. Um, and so then therefore it's minimizing the amount of heterogeneity you might otherwise observe. In this paper we did, we found this quite strongly that inequality had almost no effect when you use tracks or block groups, because again, they're constructed to minimize that difference. These ego hoods with these, this spatial um, pattern to them picked up very, very strong effects of uh, positive relation between inequality and crime in that paper. So in this project, we're gonna use these ego hoods. And the ego hood again is basically, it's, it's some buffer, quarter mile, half mile, three quarter, whatever, but no distance. So it's saying, okay, this is a unit. It comes out of that idea of the, of the neighborhood study. So rather than a decay, it's it's unit itself. It just happens to be an overlapping unit. Third, this idea of relational. Um, and here the idea is that nearby difference matters. And so we can measure the environment around the micro units, how different is the area. So if you live on a block that's very different in income or different in race than what's nearby you, um, that might impact the amount of crime that occurs there, whether it's for various um, mechanisms. And indeed, there's some evidence of that in the literature. And we can do the same thing with meso units, if you will. So we could use ego hoods and say, what about the buffer around the ego hood? Does that matter? And we also can think about um, cities. Cities might have a reputation for higher SES. That reputation might drive um, offender behavior. And so we can account for that as well. So again, very explicitly uh, relational in those measures. So that's the setup. That's what we're doing. Um, the study area is um, Southern California here, where we have street segments in many cities across the area as part of this big project. We've collected a lot of crime data. We aggregate the crime data in street segments. We estimate negative binomial regression models of counts of number of crime on segments. And so then in the project, and like I said, I'm only gonna briefly mention what we've found so far, but we decided to create these measures and we decided what are they capturing? Um, for instance, these ones that we thought were crime opportunities, for instance, measuring employees in retail, restaurants, bars, liquor stores, vacant units, older housing that might be decay or disorder. Um, we used a very sharp decay. And so we used a few different ones um, that's an area that we're still working on as part of this project, but we, as a first cut, we used a few different sharp, relatively sharp decays. Um, for some measures, we weren't sure would it be a sharp or average decay, so we used a broader number of decay functions on them, whether these are cap capturing opportunities or guardianship, parkland, for instance, you know, that can have a larger effect that it affects cohesion in a neighborhood or it might be a very sharp effect of opportunities. Um, we talk about potential guardianship. We used a more average decay. Some, and this goes back to some of the Shaw and McKay literature of concentrated disadvantage, instability, ethnic composition, as measures that might uh, entail more guardians. And so therefore we used an average decay on this and some different values. Percent vote, it was a crude attempt at um, social capital, if you will, in a neighborhood. Um, and then we had a broader decay for these potential offenders, targets, or guardians. So simply population, you know, if anyone is a potential offender, um, we wanted a broader decay of where um, people might be likely to go. Likewise, if younger people are more likely to be offenders, we looked at that as well. Volunteer organizations might help reduce offenders. And so we were using that, again, as a broader decay. For our spatial measures, mixing, we measured in ego hoods. And again, it was heterogeneity and inequality. We also used heterogeneity. And then relational, these street segments to nearby, we were looking at the difference in 
we did a few different things. I think the main one probably would be income. To what extent is the income different? We also looked at ownership and vacancies and rates. Um, and then finally, some of these other relational measures at a bigger scale, you know, eaglehood compared to nearby, difference in income, vacancies, et cetera, and then also the city, SES. So that's the setup of what we're going to do. And conveniently, I'm, I don't have much time to talk about results, and that's okay, because we're, we've got very preliminary results. And this is what, like I said, this is the goal, and this is what we're working on now. Um, part of our challenge is to estimate different models with these different decays. And you can imagine if you have enough different dimensions, um, it can get to be a large number of potential models. And it's also questionable whether we want to do model choice based on the best model fit. But nonetheless, just as some preliminary results, pretty um, seem to be what we we're broadly expecting. Um, indeed, for the, the sharp decay for crime opportunities, um, it was less steep um, for aggravated assault, but it was very steep for the other crime types. So again, we were making this distinction by between different types of crime, assault, robbery, burglary, motor vehicle theft, and larceny. Um, parks, likewise, very steep for larceny, but much less steep for the other types of crime, which was more in what we kind of had expected. Um, those guardianship measures um, were very steep for robbery, homicide, motor vehicle theft, um, for those nearby crimes, less so for burglary and lease for those other two crime types. And like for churches and volunteer organizations were less steep. Um, in general, you can see these are these beta um, values for them. For these, in general, we were measuring much less steep functions. And um, in general, um, the broadest was for aggravated assault. And for the ego hoods, we tried quarter and half mile and the half mile were consistently doing a better job for us. Anyway, let me conclude. I've thrown a lot at you. And like I, you see that our goal here is trying to think um, more explicitly about these spatial patterns and where people go. So rather than just aggregating some unit and then saying, okay, do I have to do a, you know, a spatial lag function or something like that? We're trying to explicitly think about where offenders might go and, and, um, and what our measures might capture. And of course, that's one of the biggest challenges for us. What are the measures capturing? Often in these studies, they'll, they'll create measures of disadvantage or racial composition, but what is that? Are those offenders, are those targets, are they guardians? And that can matter for the spatial decay um, we might expect them to have. Um, second, to what extent does this impact the expected spatial scale? Um, and then third, how do we determine the optimal scale of these? You know, is it simply based on model fit? And we can do that, we can grind through it, but is that really um, the best way to do it? And that's something we're still giving thought to. You know, there's multiple model comparison methods out there. Um, and then final point, does this improve the model fit? Must it, is that really the goal? Um, so those are areas where we're at um, as far as thinking about it, but, um, at this point, um, this is the setup and this is the direction we're going with it. So I will pause there or I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Excellent. 